Good morning. Welcome to University United Methodist Church. My name is Toby Nguyen. I'm the pastor of Outreach, and we are so glad to be together in worship this morning. As the service begins, you can register your attendance and access the bulletin by following the links in this post. Let us now center our hearts and minds for worship. Let us join together in the opening prayer. God, you have modeled for us time and time again what it looks like to step out and be who we are called to be. Since the beginning, you have been revealing your true self to us in different forms, but we always struggle to understand. In Jesus, you took on the flesh of an infant, made yourself vulnerable, risked everything, all in hopes of deepening your relationship with us. Like our ancestors who responded to your being who you were called to be with violence and rejection, we acknowledge we too turn away from your revelation in unexpected people and places today. By your spirit, Make us the kind of community where those who seek to be who they were created to be can find home, family, and embrace. Amen. Hey, good morning, Charlie. Hey. Hey. Oh, cool shirt. I love rainbows. Thanks. Yeah, I, I really like this shirt, too. I wear it as a reminder that God loves me for who I am. Oh, that, that's cool. Uh, how does a rainbow do that? Well, the rainbow has become a symbol to celebrate diversity. You know, that it's okay to be different. Like all of the colors of the rainbow, humanity is better when we take joy in our differences. What kind, of, what kind of differences are we talking about? Well, specifically, the rainbow flag is a symbol of gay pride. I'm sure you've seen a lot of movies uh, with love stories, you know, where the prince and the princess fall in love. Well, for mm -hmm. most people around the world, a man and woman fall in love and get married. But there mm -hmm. are also a lot of people like me, too. I am in love with another man. And there are women who fall in love with other women. And there are people who may look like a girl or a boy on the outside, but on the inside, they know they are not. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah, I am married to a man and I'm really happy with who I am. And I've been really glad to see how happy you are in your relationship. Thank you. And I'm really glad to see how happy you are in your relationship. But you know, it's not always been easy for people like me to love the people that God made us to love. I guess I, guess I haven't thought much about that. I mean, what do you mean? Well, gay marriage was only legalized in America in 2015. Before that, it was illegal for us to marry the people we loved. For a long time, we weren't even safe to show who we really loved in public. You weren't safe? Uh, that's really unfair. I can't imagine what it would be like to not be safe to love my husband in public. What made it even worse was that a lot of people used the Bible to hurt people like me. They said that God was very unhappy with people like me. For most of my life, I was very scared to let anyone know that I was different. For most of my life, I thought that maybe God didn't love me the way God loved everybody else because of the ways that I was different. But God loves you exactly the way you are. You don't have to do anything to earn God's love. Nothing can separate you from the love of God for you in Christ Jesus. Thanks. Yeah. I know that, and I, I believe that now because I belong to this church that has proven um, that love to me. This church has become a safe place for me and for people like me. But the truth is, 
there are still a lot of people who don't understand. And there's a lot of churches that are very unsafe for people like me. That is awful. Ah. Okay, well, now you've got me wondering, how can I help? I mean, can I help? Do you need help? <laughs> well, thanks for asking. That's really a big question. I mean, you're already helping because you're listening to me and that, that makes a big difference to me. Another way you can help is to take time to learn more about the LGBT community. LGBT, what do those letters stand for again? Yeah, that can be hard to remember sometimes. LGBT stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. Like the colors of the rainbow, LGBT reminds us that God created a diversity of people who experience the world in very different ways. And God loves each of us and delights in the creativity of our different lives. There you go. That's the next thing you can do to help. It is? What did I do? <laughs> well, you weren't afraid to say what you believe in support of the LGBT community. When you see others saying or doing things that hurt us, you make a difference when you speak the truth in love. Mm -hmm. Hey, Charlie. Yes, Rebecca. Thanks for being you. You know what? Thank you for being you. You shine the love of Christ right into my heart. Hmm. And you for me. Hmm. You know, I better go. I've got some work to do so that I can be a better friend to my LGBT siblings. All right. I'll see you next time, Rebecca. Bye. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. One of the great gifts during this pandemic period is being able to connect with folks uh, from all around. And uh, those that I have gathered on this call represent uh, our church gathered in different places. So um, I've got Mary Gray Leonard, who's a member of our church and uh, lives just down the street uh, from me, actually. But also I've got Mary and Laura, who live in Roanoke as well. Well, so Mary, what's it been like to connect with us all the way from Roanoke? I enjoy every Sunday, like getting on church because every morning, like live chat, the whole church greets us. And that's really nice. And it's just like makes me feel really good after it. And just like makes me smile a lot. I just like Sundays. I look forward to that for that reason. I love it. And I'll tell y'all, I've never felt like a YouTube star before until I had conversation <laughs> with Mary. Um, Laura, what about you? So I am a child of UUMC. I grew up going to the church there. So there really is no place like home. It's been really nice to be able to reconnect with our church life and family and seeing folks on screen and to be, even though we're distant and apart, to feel like I'm still connected there with my family. And Mary Gray, how about you? How's it been connecting with these uh, folks as you connect uh, with us at church? Well, it was wonderful uh, during sort of the time during the pandemic when when we couldn't come to church um, to know that my family was actually worshiping at the same time that we were. So um, it's, it's been great. Well, it uh, it's just been tremendous. I'm thankful that families are able to uh, join together across broad uh, geographies and that folks who've not been to University Church before have been able to uh, connect from uh, different places across uh, the country and even across the world uh, as well. We're thankful for the generosity of our church that has made all of this technological uh, innovation uh, possible and we we are thankful for the sweet, sweet spirit that is among us uh, across the geographies uh, in which we're gathered. 
Um, as we move into uh, our time of offering, and you can text in your gift by texting University UMC to the number that's on your screen. If you're a member of another local church community, we encourage you to give locally as well. May we give with glad and generous hearts. A reading from the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. An angel from the Lord spoke to Philip. At noon, take the road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he did. Meanwhile, an Ethiopian man was on his way home from Jerusalem, where he had come to worship. He was a eunuch and an official responsible for the entire treasury of Cadence. Cadence is a title given to the Ethiopian queen. He was reading the prophet Isaiah while sitting in his carriage. The spirit told Philip, approach this carriage and stay with it. Running up to the carriage, Philip heard the man reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you really understand what you're reading? The man replied, without someone to guide me, how could I? Then he invited Philip to climb up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture he was reading. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he didn't open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was taken away from him. Who could tell the story of his descendants because his life was taken from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, tell me about whom does this prophet say this? Is he talking about himself or someone else? Starting with the passage, Philip proclaimed the good news about Jesus to him. As they went down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, water, what would keep me from being baptized? He ordered the carriage halt. Both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water where Philip baptized them. When they came up out of the water, the Lord's spirit suddenly took Philip away. The eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church family. Uh, this Sunday, we are in the second week of our Asking for a Friend sermon series. What I mentioned last week is that we'd be using what we call the Wesleyan or the Methodist quadrilateral to talk about each of the questions that have been given to us. This week we'll use the quadrilateral to talk about inclusion, particularly inclusion around sexuality. As we prepare to do so, please go with me to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Lord, I pray that you would speak through me and perhaps even in spite of me. And so let the humble words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Earlier in the worship service, at the beginning of the children's moment, we saw a picture of the doors that are on the church's front lawn, the rainbow doors that say, God's doors are open to all. One of the things that this communicates to us is that here in our church, we seek to make room for one another, to create space for one another. And the only thing that we seek to exclude is exclusion itself. We seek to make space and exclude exclusion. This is a place where everyone belongs. They're rainbow doors and they're meant to be a sign to our LGBT siblings who are part of our church and who are part of the broader community. A specific sign, a specific message that reminds that you belong here. We are all family here. And whether we are gay or straight, we're all normal. We're all who God created us to be. And so we hope that this is a welcoming space. I rarely use the language of safe space, but we hope that this is a, a welcoming space and a brave space. A space where we can be together, connected to one another, connected to God, 
and allow God to work in us and through us as we seek to be more fully who God has created each of us to be. A brave space, a welcoming space, a space that makes room for one another and where we seek to exclude exclusion itself. The question that prompted today's message was around Christianity and the Bible and uh, human sexuality, particularly homosexuality. And so what I hope to do today is not list every argument that could be made toward inclusion. Um, there's not enough time in the message to do that. What I do hope to do is to use the Wesleyan quadrilateral or the quadrilateral, which talks about scripture, tradition, experience, and reason, and talk about how God can speak to us in each of those categories, and those categories can work together to create a broader understanding that leads us to inclusion. One of the temptations as we feel convicted and moved that uh, God is calling all of our siblings, gay and straight, to be a part of God's uh, church. And that as we read scripture, we say, gosh, I just, um, I don't know exactly how to uh, take this handful of passages uh, that seem to uh, be moving in a different direction and reconcile them. And so we're tempted to just move scripture aside and say, hey, I know what to believe and I'm moving in this other direction. And yes, God is speaking to us uh, in ways that are through our experience and through our reason and other means. But I'd encourage us not to uh, leave Scripture aside. We, we base our lives as Christians on Scripture. I think what we're called to do is learn how to read Scripture well together, how to interpret Scripture well together. We do not believe in interpreting Scripture as literalists. That's not how the Methodist Church, and indeed, that's not how the church across its many centuries has primarily interpreted Scripture. Uh, we read a passage of Scripture or a set of verses in Scripture uh, in conjunction with the broad witness of Scripture and how God is revealing God's self to us. So this is what I hope that we can think through today as we talk about the quadrilateral. Now I'll say, uh, before we dive into the quadrilateral specifically, as we interpret scripture, you know, we do use shorthands. And often I hear in Bible studies folks using um, love as a shorthand and, and grace as a shorthand and compassion and mercy and inclusion. And I would absolutely uh, uphold those. If you're interpreting scripture and you're trying to figure out where to go, if you're unsure, absolutely lean toward love and grace and mercy and compassion and inclusion. If you're gonna lean in a direction, lean toward those things. And use those interpretive guides as we read scripture together, as we interpret scripture together. So without further ado, let's jump into the quadrilateral and talk about how the quadrilateral can help us as we think about sexuality. I wanna begin our conversation about the quadrilateral with scripture. What I've listed here are the seven scriptures at the top of the whiteboard that are often used when talking about homosexuality. The first five are ones that uh, progressives generally appeal to in uh, interpreting. And then the last two are ones that conservatives uh, typically add to the conversation. Um, but each of these I've listed here, I'm not going to go into depth on them, but wanted you to have them so you can read through uh, those chapters. So when we think about scripture, the question is, are we going to have a plain sense or literal reading of it, or we're we going to uh, interpret scripture? Uh, as Methodists, 
we don't do this plain sense literal uh, interpretations. We uh, use the broad scope of Scripture to interpret. I would argue that all um, reading explication of Scripture is interpretation. All of it is. We all speak from a a cultural standpoint with uh, a cultural lens. Christianity is instantiated. Christianity uh, is contextual. And so uh, through uh, different cultures across time, uh, different languages, different ways of seeing uh, one another and our interactions, we interpret from these places. And so everything is interpretation. Every ta- reading and talk of Scripture um, is an interpretation. When it comes to interpreting and working through these seven Scriptures, I would um, encourage uh, the reading of a book. It's called Unclobber. And it's by Colby Martin. Colby is a, an evangelical um, preacher who's had a transformation in his understanding of uh, homosexuality. And so he takes these clobber verses and talks about um, unclobbering them, uh, shifting how we interpret uh, them. I just want to say a couple more uh, things here. So when you look at the references in each of these, um, there are uh, are different things that we should see. They are not, by and large, talking about the kinds of mutual relationships that we are talking about today. So there's a power differential. Power differential. if if, what these scriptures are talking about is uh, someone who has power over somebody else who may or may not be willing to engage in an intimate activity, uh, it is not the same as a, as a mutual relationship. And that's the, that's the argument uh, here that is used uh, most often uh, as it relates to, to Scripture. And, and uh, Colby Martin does a, a great job at this. And so we're comparing apples to oranges uh, in a way as we look at what's said here in these Scriptures and, and what we are trying to talk about as far as mutual relationships. I want to mention just briefly here, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. In 1946, in the uh, Revised Standard Version of the Bible, and this is different than the New Revised Standard Version, which is version which is the version that um, we use at our church uh, before we started using the Common English Bible. So in the RSV, uh, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, they began to translate uh, two Greek words uh, into homosexuality. Well, since that time, even in translations that have shifted to sexual immorality, which talks about more things, uh, the two, uh, homosexuality and sexual immorality, have been tied together in the minds of some Christians. Well, sexual immorality really has a broader context. Uh, many of the things that uh, some would say is, is good, fun, adventure might fit into that category of sexual immorality for Brother Paul. And so it's really important not to uh, constrict or rest- uh, restrict our understanding uh, to homosexuality. It's also important to remember, again, this broader context of power. What we're talking about here is a kind of relating that is very different, I think, than the kinds of relating that we are talking about in mutual relationship. So let's look at some of the other areas of the quadrilateral that might help us as we think through what we're talking about here in Scripture. There are interpretive modes that lead some toward inclusion and some toward exclusion. Let's talk about tradition. 
When John Wesley talked about tradition, he was talking about the tradition of the Anglican Church and the tradition of the church before it became the official religion of the Holy Roman Empire. We th tend to think of the broad history of the Christian church. And when you look at the broad history of the Christian church, when it comes to uh, sexual orientation, uh, there is uh, an exclusive posture in so many ways. But let's also think about other areas of interpretation. Uh, for instance, slavery, women in ministry, or divorce. For generations, for centuries, uh, there were uh, restrictive traditions uh, related to each of these areas. But over time, there was a more expansive revelation. Uh, people began to see something different in Scripture, different in how uh, God was guiding God's people. Uh, there are people who prayed for generations for this revelation to be widely accepted. And so we remain open to that even today, that God, as God reveals God's self to us, will show us different things, will lead us to uh, new interpretations, even when there have been interpretations that were longstanding for generations or even centuries. And so we do look at the tra tra tradition of the church. We take it uh, seriously. And at the same time, we take God's revelation seriously. And we know from Christian history that traditions can change. When we talk about experience, we're talking about the experience of God's spirit in our everyday lives. We're talking about stories. For some, stories lead them toward a greater exclusion and others, a greater inclusion. For me and for many of those around me, it's led us toward a greater inclusion. Now, I'm a part of the Methodist church because a gay man invited me to be a part of it. I didn't know uh, that he was gay at the time, but it doesn't matter. God's spirit working through him um, uh, consistently uh, saying to me, come to church. It'll make a difference in your life. And it absolutely has made a difference in my life. Uh, I think about um, one of my brothers um, who is gay. Uh, tragically, he passed away a few years ago, but I think about God's Spirit working through his life. And I, I think about reading his prayer journals, some of the most beautifully written prayers and reflections. So think about God's grace working through uh, LGBT uh, siblings in powerful ways. And so these experiences of God's presence and God's spirit have led me to a place of inclusion. And so I think about those experiences as it relates to the tradition of interpretation in the church and the interpretive modes around Scripture. And it moves me to this place of inclusion. And finally, reason. Reason helps us in our interpretation. It helps us to gain clarity, to relate the church's witness to the full range of human knowledge. Uh, we interact with disciplines like philosophy, sociology, biology, history, and others. We believe that God has given us um, intellect to, to reason. And as we apply reason, uh, particularly um, as we 
apply reason scientifically and and we look at what science tells us uh, there's a kind of a clarity that uh, people are born with a sexual orientation and that this is who they're created to be so when we when we take this clear scientific reasoning and we look at the experiences that we're having of the Spirit, when we look at the traditions of the church, and then we focus in again on Scripture, we say that now there's a, quite a body of collected evidence, both scientifically um, and through our experience of the Spirit. There's so much that leads us toward a greater inclusion. And we look at the tradition of the church and, and we ask questions around fresh revelation from God. And then we look back at scriptures, even uh, the scripture that was read today about the Ethiopian eunuch. So the Ethiopian eunuch is a minority in uh, several ways, is a um, gender minority. Uh, and the term eunuch uh, can refer to uh, several ways of being a sexual minority uh, in society. And so he is a gender uh, variant, or they are a gender uh, variant. Um, the eunuch is a racial, uh, ethnic minority and is a person who is, um, f a f they would say, a foreigner. And so in all these different ways, the Ethiopian eunuch is someone who sits outside of the community. But here we have this wonderful moment of inclusion of this eunuch who is baptized. So we take what we know and the clarity uh, around scientific reasoning and our experience of the Holy Spirit as we interact with others, as we consider the traditions of the church, but also consider that there may be this fresh revelation that is happening. And then we look at scriptures like this passage with the Ethiopian eunuch and other passages of scripture and we talk about both the social conventions of the time and ask questions whether we're looking at apples and oranges when we talk about the ways of relating uh, that we're considering today that the quadrilateral really can be helpful as we move toward um, a clarity around our inclusion and it's because we're thinking, we're really thinking through these things. We have what we feel in our gut, what we feel in our heart, but we're using all the faculties that God has given us to think well about the faith, to take the Bible seriously. Sometimes to take the Bible seriously, it means that we don't take the Bible literally. And we look at ways of understanding the character of God in Scripture and the character that God is revealing to us to help us arrive at a conclusion. We look at how God is revealing God's truth to us in scientific disciplines um, that help us to interpret. And so I hope that you will use uh, this rubric of the quadrilateral to help you as you continue to think through uh, not only the matters we are discussing today, but as you think through all the questions of our faith. 
We've covered a lot of ground in a relatively short amount of time. As I said at the beginning of the message, I was not going to create an exhaustive argument about LGBT inclusion in the life of the church, but what I hope is that our conversation today will be helpful as you think about these things as, as individuals and as we think about these things together as a community of faith. My challenge to us is to think about those words that are on the front lawn, God's doors are open to all. What does that mean? What I hope it means is that we seek to be a community of kinship where no one is left out. The challenge this week is to think about that. What does it mean for us to be a community of kinship where no one is left out? What's your part in the creation of that community? This beloved community that we believe God is cultivating here in our church and this beloved community that we pray that God is cultivating everywhere. We seek to be a community of kinship that communicates that God's doors are open to all, that we create a space for one another, that we exclude exclusion. This is a place where you belong, where you can come and be loved. We are not perfect people. We're all broken people, but God is mending each of us and creating out of us a beautiful, beloved, diverse community where you and I belong. Thanks be to God for what God is doing and what God will continue to do among us as we seek God's will and as we seek to be the community that God had in mind when God created us. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We have been gathered for worship and now we depart to serve. As you go forth, remember that wherever you are, that's where the ministry of the church happens. And so as you move into this week, know that we love you. We hope you have a great week and may the peace of Christ be with you. Amen.
Thank you.